with the release of the Divine Messenger, I'm finally able to, on these off weeks, occasionally speak about appearances of the Son of God in the Old Testament. And I've so wanted to, but you know, part of me is going, oh, I just want to be able to point somebody to a resource if they really need it. But I want to talk about my favorite appearance of Jesus Christ. Now, it wasn't called Jesus, but my favorite appearance of the Son of God in the Old Testament, before he was born as a man. Because never forget, the Son of God is eternal God. So he didn't just show up in the last quarter of the Bible. He was in the Old Testament as well, just not as a man yet. And my favorite appearance is as the angel of the Lord in Zechariah 3. Now we often talk about being covered in the blood of the Lamb, do we not? This is sort of Christian vernacular. And if you're not a Christian, that must seem like an odd statement. But it makes great sense to us. And it's a good and right thing to talk about. Being covered in the blood of the Lamb means that the righteousness of Jesus himself has been imputed upon us. The Lord sees his righteousness, his life upon us, his blood, so to speak. But there's another way that scripture describes our Savior's righteousness being imputed upon us through faith. If we place our full trust in Jesus, we'll be covered by the blood of the Lamb and we'll be clothed in righteousness. In our reading from Zechariah this morning, we're about to learn about an incredible vision. It's a vision that has both Satan and the pre-incarnate Son of God in it. So that's exciting right there, isn't it? It's about the redemption of the high priest Joshua in Zechariah's day. It's also about the redemption of Israel as a nation in the future. And it's about the redemption of each one of us who has been declared righteous through our faith in Jesus. And this isn't just me being preachy and going, here's a historical thing and I'm going to find a way to apply it. Sometimes I have to do that. No, this actually transcends time. What we see here very much applies to the prophet's day, very much has a prophetic fulfillment, and it continues to have a direct application to us biblically to every person who's saved by trusting in Jesus. Let's begin with Zechariah 3, verses 1 through 2. Then he showed me Joshua, the high priest, standing before the angel of the Lord, and Satan standing at his right hand to accuse him. The Lord said to Satan, The Lord rebuke you, Satan. Indeed, the Lord who has chosen Jerusalem rebuke you. Is this not a brand plucked from the fire? We'll stop here. We're still in the vision. But Zechariah shown this vision. It's evidently said in the temple. It's not explicitly stated, but evidently he's seeing a vision within the temple, which hadn't been built yet. Remember, the temple had been destroyed. And now he's seeing this vision seemingly set in the temple. That's because part of the purpose of this vision is to encourage the Israelites to build the next temple. But that's tied in to their faithfulness to the Lord. So that's actually the more important aspect of the vision. The prophet saw Joshua, the high priest. He's standing before the angel of the Lord, the angel of Yahweh. The fact that Joshua is named the high priest here prophet goes out of his way to say the high priest even though we know he's the high priest but he's reminding the reader and i believe he's doing that to suggest that he in this vision represents the nation he's one person but he's representing the nation so that's important too before we move on who's ever seen maybe there's an old trope in some old tv i don't see it as much anymore but i, I like to watch a lot of old tv i find it better and there's this old trope where someone is conflicted on doing good or bad, and on one shoulder there's like a good angel, and he's whispering, he goes, you should do good things and, and give compliments to people. And there's, one on, there's a devil on the other shoulder going, no, you should call that person ugly. And, or someone's trying to tempt you. There's the, the good angel and the bad angel, right? And the little devil. Has anyone seen this trope on TV? I've seen it. I haven't seen it as much anymore. And it's kind of odd, Here's the really weird thing. It's actually semi-based in Scripture. Now, it doesn't mean that 
there's actually someone on the shoulder. That's a little silly, but still. So I believe that this imagery is based on saints standing on one side of Joshua to accuse him, and on another side of Joshua is the angel of the Lord who wants to bring redemption to Joshua. So we have Satan on one side, angel of the Lord on the other. Now, there are a couple differences between this vision and the trope, of course. First, Satan and the good angel were not on Joshua's shoulders. Again, that would be a little bit silly. Second, the angel of the Lord is no normal created angel. He's not a created being. He is, in fact, the pre-incarnate Son of God. He who, after the incarnation, would be known as Jesus Christ. I can't get into all the reasons. I can actually <coughs> prove this is the case by comparing 1 Corinthians 10 and where it says Christ sent the serpent. Then you go back into the Old Testament and you will ultimately see it is the angel of the Lord, the angel of Yahweh's name in him, who sent the serpents upon the people. So we have the New Testament confirming this. But in short, I should remind everybody that angel in Hebrew doesn't necessarily mean person with wings. Isn't that what we think of though, right? I must admit, I still do too. But angel actually means, it's malach, it means a messenger. So it's a messenger. Now sometimes a messenger has wings. So don't get me wrong, there are angels that have wings. They do exist. But here, all the Hebrew is saying is Yahweh messenger. When we translate it as angel of the Lord. Yahweh messenger. In fact, not getting into the Hebrew too much, but it's in the Smichu clause, so it's sort of saying it's a Yahweh-ish messenger. It's a messenger who is somehow Yahweh himself. So, what would we sort of think of that as? We would think of the Word who is God and is with God, right? Like in John. He is him, but he's also with him. So we see a messenger who is Yahweh, and he's different than Yahweh in heaven. So, we see the same sort of comparison here. Of course, Jesus himself, uh, well, we're going to see soon that the angel of the Lord is actually called Yahweh. He's, he is called, he is God. We're going to see that in the text. Yet Jesus himself told us in John 6, no one has ever seen the Father except he who comes from the Father. So only Jesus has seen the Father. So if people saw God in the Old Testament, it could have been the Father. No, no one has ever seen the Father at any time. Furthermore, we know that the classic John 1.18, no one has seen God at any time, but the God who is in his bosom has explained him. So God hasn't been seen, but the God that is with him has been seen, and that is the Son of God, because he expresses and makes the Father known. And we see this design exist before the Incarnation. Now we see Satan standing at Joshua's right hand. He's ready to accuse Joshua in the presence of the angel of the Lord, in the presence of the pre-incarnate Son of God. The angel of the Lord is explicitly called Yahweh at the opening of verse 2. He's flat out called, he is, in the Hebrew. He is. In other words, he's called, I am that I am. He's referred to as the great God of Israel, even though he's the angel of Yahweh. So you can already see how he's a messenger of Yahweh. He's Yahweh himself, as we see with the Son of God. This means that the angel of Yahweh rebuked Satan in the name of Yahweh. This is kind of a complicated thing to say, isn't it? Put another way, if we were to use the New Testament, which gives us more details, and that is good to understand this, we could say this. God the Son rebuked Satan in the name of God the Father. Ah, oh, we see Jesus say similar things, don't we, in the New Testament? Yes, the Israelites had fallen into great sin, and they paid for it by being exiled into Babylon for 70 years. But the Lord was not done with the Israelites. He still had a sovereign purpose for Jerusalem and for the remnant of his people that had returned from exile in Babylon. These so-called brand plucked from the fire. He's taken them out of Babylon, put them back in their land, has a purpose. Since the Israelites were never going to be righteous enough on their own, the Lord would have to personally make his own righteousness available to them. Let's read verses 3 through 5. Again, this is verses 3 through 5. 
And this is stunning, by the way. I'll just tell you ahead of time. This is such a powerful passage. It's one of my favorite. Now Joshua was clothed with filthy garments and standing before the angel. He spoke and said to those who were standing before him, saying, Remove the filthy garments from him. Again he said to him, See, I have taken your iniquity away from you, and I will clothe you with festal robes. Then I said, Let them put a clean turban on his head. So they put a clean turban on his head and clothed him with garments, while the angel of the Lord was standing by. Joshua, in this vision, he has dirty clothes on. He's the high priest. He's representing the nation, and he has filthy clothes on. And we're, we know from this that symbolized the nation's sin, their iniquity. But it was the angel of the Lord who ordered some angelic attendants, evidently. There were some actual created angels here to remove Joshua's filthy clothes. So he's saying, take those dirty clothes off. He's personally doing it. And once the filthy clothes are removed, the nation's iniquity, the nation's sin had been removed. Then, and catch this. The angel of the Lord told Joshua that he had removed Joshua's iniquity and that he would clothe Joshua with festal robes. So the angel of the Lord is personally doing this. I'm taking the sin away. I'm giving you clean clothes. Then something unusual happened. This is incredible. There's so many visions in the Old Testament. And what do the prophets usually do? They just take them in. They're overwhelmed by them, aren't they? This, is, this might be the only time this has happened. You know, I shouldn't wait till a sermon to speculate about that out loud. I should act like I definitely know. But um, something very odd happened. As Zechariah is seeing the vision, he's so overwhelmed by its power that he couldn't help but interject. He's seeing the angel of the Lord, whether this is, he's seeing it in person. It's hard to say the nature of this vision. And the angel of the Lord saying, remove the clothes take away the dirty clothes, but let's, let's get some clean clothes, and then he, he can't help but participate. Usually a prophet just sees a vision, he goes, and put a nice clean hat on him too. Wow, that's amazing. He declared that a clean turban should be put on Joshua's head, so he just has to get a little bit in there. I understand, that's how powerful it is. These festal robes and the turban, they made for what is a clean set of priestly garments. So he had filthy priestly garments on. Now he's getting clean priestly garments. Where once the head of the nation symbolized the sin of the nation, now he is representing the nation redeemed and cleaned. These clean garments no doubt symbolize God's righteousness. And because they came from the divine angel, the clean garments more specifically symbolized the righteousness of the Son of God. And we know this from the New Testament. Now, if we only had Zechariah, this wouldn't be as clear to us. It'd be mysterious. How can an angel who was Yahweh himself give his righteousness to somebody? That would be a great mystery, would it not? Because he's representing Yahweh, but he's not Yahweh in heaven, but he's giving righteousness. Who can, who's the only person who can give righteousness that can get rid of sin? God. So somehow God on earth is doing this only be the Son. And because the New Testament, we're able to understand this with more information. That's why I can boldly tell you this morning, this must be God, the Son. By the way, this is almost a universal conclusion. So this isn't just me. This is universally recognized in Christianity. Once the clean clothes were put on Joshua, the high priest and the nation he represented were fully cleansed of their sin. The people of Israel can never be righteous on their own. So the son would have to offer them his own righteousness. Doesn't that apply to us? I mean, you finally just have to get to a point where you go, I can never do it. I can never be good enough on my own to earn salvation, to earn God's favor. At a certain point, if you're really on the good spiritual walk, you're just pushed to a point where you go, you have to do it for me, Lord. I just have to follow your mercy and trust in you. I need your help. I need your righteousness. Not 50% of it, not 99% of it. I need you to do it for me. And I just ask and trust in you to do it. And so this is, applies to very much to us. The vast majority of conservative scholars, as I said, 
believe that the angel of the Lord in Zechariah 3 is the second person of the Trinity, of course, the Son. One of them is the 19th century German theologian E.W. Hengstenberg. He explained that, quote, the prophet here also sees the high priest Joshua as such engaged in serving the angel of the Lord, who in the second verse appears under the name Jehovah, Yahweh, which belongs to God alone, and who in the fourth verse ascribes to himself a word exclusively divine, a work, a work exclusively divine, the forgiveness of sins. If the angel of the Lord was not God himself, he could not forgive sins. That would be, he should be cast into hell for even claiming he could do so. But he does so boldly because he is no normal created being. Of course, Hengstenberg is quite right. Only God can forgive sins. And the Son of God is God. If you remember when we were in Matthew 9 last year, we read in verse 6 that Jesus, the Son of Man, declared that he had the authority to forgive sins. The angel of the Lord and the Son of God are one and the same. See, Jesus himself says the Son of Man has the authority to forgive sins. Why would he say Son of Man there? Because he's, it's obvious he's the Son of God. So he's saying, now the God-man, I have this authority as a man. But he had it previously because he is the eternal Son. The great Redeemer in the Old Testament, the one who forgave sins in the Old Testament time and time again, appeared many times, forgave sins, gave guidance. That Redeemer, he is the same as our Savior from the New Testament, who we know as Jesus Christ. Of course, filthy garments are used to symbolize sin, and clean garments are used to symbolize righteousness and several other places in the Scripture. Of which are too many to cover this morning. But just to give you an idea, in Isaiah 64, 6, the deeds of sinful Israel are likened to a filthy garment. However, in contrast, during the future reign of the Messiah, as spoken of Isaiah 61, 10, Israel will be clothed with, quote, garments of salvation and wrapped with a, quote, robe of righteousness. And the parable of the wedding feast, Jesus used wedding clothes to symbolize the imputed righteousness of Christ. Of course, you can find that in Matthew 22, 11. We'll get there in our Matthew series. Bright and clean linen is used to represent the righteous acts of the saints in Revelation 19, 8. And you might say, ah, oh, there it's used to represent their righteous acts, though, pastor. <laughs> ah, but that verse states that it was given to the saints to clothe themselves in this fine linen which means that their righteous acts were only possible because they had been clothed by the righteousness of God through faith in Christ. I see two or three of you taking notes, so you could use Romans 3, 21 through 22 for New Testament proof. You could use Philippians 3, 9 as well. Now with the understanding that the angel of the Lord was the Son of God, this vision in Zechariah 3, 1 through 5 becomes a powerful depiction of the Son taking away sin and imputing his own righteousness on the sinner. And the need for the imputed righteousness of Christ is at the very heart of the gospel. It's at the very core of our faith. In fact, the Son of God replacing filthy clothes with clean ones is a powerful illustration of what we read in 2 Corinthians 521, which is undoubtedly one of the most important verses in the Bible. Yes, I hesitate to say one is more important than others because they all form one unified whole. But if you can only memorize a few, this really should be one of them. Let's read 517 through 21 for context, though. And we'll focus on verse 21. This is 2 Corinthians 517 through 21. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creature. The old things passed away. Behold, new things have come. Now all these things are from God, who reconciled us, us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation, namely, that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them. And he has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God were making an appeal through us. We beg you on behalf of Christ, 
be reconciled to God. He made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. This verse, 2 Corinthians 5.21, is so well known and so loved throughout church history that it took on a nickname. The Great Exchange. The Great Exchange. Good job, Rocky. You get, you get extra credit for this morning's <laughs> service. But that's absolutely right. In fact, I just wanted to confirm this. And I, you know, I was doing a little research and I went, okay, is this often called that? Yes, a lot of commentators call it that. And then I found one commentator that called it, he goes, I call it the wonderful exchange. And I was like, oh, you're just trying to one-up everybody else. Come on, get over yourself. Let's just stick with the nickname we're all familiar with. And what an apropos nickname this is, right? For the Son of God took our place. We have sinned, and thus we have deserved death and punishment. Jesus didn't sin, and he deserved life and eternal rewards. But Jesus took our place. He took our punishment. And in return, we took his place. We were given forgiveness of sins and life that we did not earn. When you trust in Jesus through placing your full trust in who he is, what he's done, his death and resurrection, when you do that, he has, in effect, switched places with you. In a manner of speaking, he takes away your filthy clothes and replaces them with his own clean clothes. Can I admit something to you this morning? And I didn't put this in the divine messenger because this is speculation. And I know some of you don't like speculation. But I just want to be honest with you, when I, when I read this vision, I can't help but think the implication is, because Hebrew implies things, doesn't always state, I can't help but when, think, when, this, when the angel of the Lord said, give me your dirty clothes, take these clean ones, I can't help but think the angel of the Lord put those dirty ones on. It's really hammered from the point. doesn't say that. That's just me and my own imagination. I, I can't help but think that might be implied. Just putting it out there. Again, that's not what's stated. Nevertheless, even without that, it's clear that the Son of God, the angel of the Lord, says, Give me your sin. Here's some righteousness. I'm switching clothes with you. Whether he puts them on or not, that remains true. Through faith, the Lord Jesus imputes his righteousness on you. That means he places it on you. It's legally on you. Even though you're not perfect, I think we all know as saved people, we still sin. No excuse for that. But it's the reality of our nature until the Bema Seat judgment when we're made perfect. But legally, through faith, the Messiah's righteousness is on us. So the Son of God, get, or I'm sorry, the whole, God the Father, guess what he does at judgment day? He sees us and he goes, I know you're a sinner, but because you trust in my Son, his righteousness is on you legally speaking. You're wearing it. It's the blood of the Lamb on you. It's a garment of righteousness. Whatever illustration you want to use, you can find several in Scripture. But the point is, it's not your righteousness, it's a righteousness placed on you. So, he imputes his own righteousness to you, thereby clothing you in righteousness. Did you know that in this situation, if the Son of God switches places with you, if he takes your dirty clothes and puts clean clothes on there, did you know there's no room for good works? But I was told several times over the past few weeks on Twitter by some other Christians that, hey, unless you live a life with Jesus as your Lord, day in and day out, you're not saved. I don't see room for that. I see him switching clothes with me. I see him putting his righteousness on me. Now, I think we should obey the Lord with all our heart. We love him. We should produce good works. But when it comes to salvation, there's no room. I either get clean clothes from him or not. He doesn't give me clothes that are almost clean. And he goes, all right, now through some good works, um, you know, you can use those little uh, Clorox sticks to rub out the rest, and that'll be your part. No, he gives me clean clothes. He puts his righteousness on me. And of course, out of that new nature, I should produce good works. But that those don't contribute to my salvation. They don't maintain my salvation. No, it's all him. I'm just the recipient. He switched places with me. There's no room for me to do anything. He did everything. Amen. Let's continue with verses 6 through 7. And the angel of the Lord admonished Joshua, saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, If you will walk in my ways, and if you will perform my service, 
then you will also govern my house and also have charge of my courts, and I will grant you free access among those who are standing here. So we're seeing the vision continue. There's some fascinating things happening here. They don't speak to our main point this morning, but sorry, you'll have to indulge me. I want to finish the vision. It's still exciting. As the vision continued, the angel of the Lord admonished Joshua. The angel, who again I believe is the son, and I think you can prove this exegetically, said that Yahweh of hosts declared that if Joshua walked in the Lord's ways and performed his service, then he would govern the Lord's temple and have charge of his courts. Joshua would also be granted the same access to the Lord's presence that the angelic attendants in the vision had. So in the vision, there's angels that are able to get close to the God of the universe. And he's promising, Joshua, if you do what you're supposed to do, you're going to have the same access. According to an ancient paraphrase of verse 7, Yahweh of hosts declared that Joshua was to perform the service of, quote, my word instead of my angel, instead of the angel. Do it. Wait a minute. So the Old Testament is calling this paraphrase of the Old Testament is referring to the angel as my word. But he's a person. But he's called a word. Just like John 1. In the beginning was the word, and the word was God, and the word was with God. John 14. The word took on flesh. We know him as Jesus Christ. Isn't that fascinating? We see these concepts in Judaism even commenting on this. It was the angel of Yahweh who the angels in the vision had access to. Incredible. This means that if Joshua obeyed the Lord as he was told to, then he would have special access to the Son of God. Through faith and obedience, we too may grow closer and closer to our Lord and Savior. And when he returns, we will have our king's ear, and we will dwell with him throughout the millennium, and then forever in the eternal state, the new Jerusalem, where he will wipe every tear from our eye. Let's continue in verses 8 through 10. Now listen, Joshua the high priest, you and your friends who are sitting in front of you, indeed they are men who are assembled. For behold, I am going to bring in my servant, the branch. For behold, the stone I have set before Joshua. On one stone are seven eyes. Behold, I will engrave an inscription on it, declares the Lord of hosts, and I will remove the iniquity of that land in one day. In that day, declares the Lord of hosts, every one of you will invite his neighbor to sit under his vine and under his fig tree. The Lord further spoke to Joshua, referring to him as the high priest. The Lord told Joshua that he and the other priests, his friends, that were sitting in front of him, were a symbol that the Lord was going to bring forth my servant, the branch. So Joshua is somehow a symbol of him. In some key messianic prophecies, my servant is used as a name for the Messiah. I think most of us know this. Isaiah 42, 1, 52, 13, 53, 11, Acts 13, or I'm sorry, Acts 3, 13, and Acts 3, 26, right? The servant, my servant. Of course, the branch is a title for the Messiah, most of us know well, for he would branch forth from Yahweh. He would grow from him. He is him, Isaiah 4.2. This is a branch from Yahweh, so he's son of Yahweh. Again, Isaiah 4.2. And he's a branch of David. For example, Jeremiah 23.5, 33.15. He's a branch, so he's a son of Yahweh, and he's a son of David. He'd have to be God and man to do that, wouldn't he? So this isn't just a Christian concept, the Messiah, Son of God, Son of Man. This means that the branch, again, the one that comes forth, he's God and man. Theologians call this the hypostatic union. If you don't want to remember that, don't worry about it. If you want to be a Bible reader, just write down hypostatic union. The Messiah is fully God, fully man, simultaneously. Things that should be in conflict are instead harmonized in one person. In Revelation 22, 16, we read that Jesus is the root and the offspring of David. As God, Jesus brought forth David and created him. As David's descendant, Jesus came from David. Isn't that incredible? He's both. Thus, my servant, the branch, when you say my servant, the branch, that's a double reference to the Messiah. 
Joshua and the priests that served under him were types of the coming Messiah. Joshua, the high priest, especially pointed to the great high priest, Jesus, the Son of God. Now Joshua, he's later crowned in Zechariah 6. He's later crowned to symbolize that the branch would be a priest and a king. This makes Joshua an especially prominent type of the Messiah. He's a living, weakened, mini version of what the Messiah would be. He's this incredible high priest. He's doing these incredible things. He's pointing to the Messiah. God himself says he's a symbol of the Messiah. That's something else, isn't it? Now, a lot of theologians find types of the Messiah. I agree with them by, by the most part. God himself is saying he's a symbol of the coming Messiah. The 18th and 19th century minister Joseph Benson stated that the angel, quote, was Christ or the Logos, whose minister or servant the high priest was, as well as a type of him. It is, and I think it's fitting that Jesus and Joshua then share the same name. And if you don't know what I'm talking about in Hebrew, Joshua and Jesus are the same name. It's the exact same name in Hebrew. So I don't think that's a coincidence. I think that's God's subtle way of going when the angel of the Lord becomes the branch, when he's born, that he is the descendant of David, when he's born, his name will be Jesus. He doesn't say that, but I think it's very interesting that the high priest, his name is Jesus here, if we were to put it in the same branch dot etymology. But again, in Hebrew, these are the same names. The pre-incarnate Son of God cleansed Joshua, preparing him to become a living symbol pointing to the incarnate Son of God. The Lord said that he set a stone with seven eyes on it before Joshua. That's strange, right? You can admit it. You can read some parts of the Bible and just go, well, that's strange. But Yahweh of hosts declared that he was about to engrave an inscription on it that would speak to him removing the iniquity of the land in one day. What could this be? I don't know. But don't worry, you know me, I'll speculate. And then Zechariah 3 concludes with Yahweh of hosts declaring that in that day, everyone will invite his neighbor to come and sit under his vine and under his fig tree, a symbol of peace and prosperity in the land. The stone could have been the capstone, which would be put in place to complete the construction of the temple. In Zechariah 4, uh, verses 7 and 9. The stone ultimately, we know, pointed to the Messiah, who's commonly symbolized as a stone. Verses, 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 verses. I can't list them all. Uh, we could go Isaiah 28, 16 if you need one. The seven eyes on the stone, of course we know from other verses, just trying to save time this morning, but represent the Messiah's ability to see and understand all things. Perfect sight. He knows and sees everything. Omniscience. We aren't told what the inscription on the stone is. Though it is apparently commemorative of the removal of sin from the nation, or something that allowed for the removal of the sin from the nation. Therefore, I can understand why it's a very popular view through much of church history that the engraving was of Jesus' wounds on the stone 500 years before Jesus is crucified. Very common view. Again, I don't know what it is, but somehow these marks represent removal of sin. From the nation. And it could also be the names of the redeemed tribes who are engraved on the stone. And I'm just getting that by, and I'm inferring that from applying Exodus 28. Jesus paid for the sins of Israel and the world with his death on the cross. Once the people of Israel as a whole come to faith in Messiah Jesus, all sin will be removed from the promised land. This will happen on the day Jesus returns. And once he returns, that people will enjoy fellowship with one another in peace and prosperity. The moment we place our full trust in Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the Lord personally gave us His righteousness. The only righteousness that can save you is the righteousness that comes from God. And that righteousness He gives you is His own. He took some of His own righteousness and placed it upon you. I want you to take great comfort in that. I certainly do. So if you take anything away from this message, 
take comfort in that fact that if you place your full trust in Jesus, his righteousness is on you. That means that on judgment day, you don't have to worry about being good enough or obedient enough. I don't want you to have fear on judgment day. If you trust in the Lord Jesus Christ with all your heart, then on that day, his righteousness will be on you. And that's because the Lord, God the Father, will not see your sins. After all, you'll be covered in the blood of the Lamb, and you'll be clothed in righteousness. Let's pray. Lord Father in heaven, 